this is about a larger systemic change about the kind of system we operate in. I believe that this is the moment that we need democracy more than ever. We need more people of all types of backgrounds to step up and offer their expertise to solve the challenges in each of our communities. Let's do what we know to be the right thing and be true to that inner voice. I didn't ask to be treated differently, but I'm gonna take it on because I have a job to do and nothing's gonna get in my way of doing that. Go get yourself a political home. You know, Vote and Lead would love to be that home. Black Voters Matter would love to mm -hmm. be that home for you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for leading and running as you are. And I have your back. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to our friends um, from the West Coast. Good afternoon to our friends in the Midwest or, our, or on the East Coast. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Pak Koo Heng, and I'm the Chief Program Officer for Vote Run Lead. And for those of you who are new to Vote Run Lead, um, our mission is to train intersectional, anti-racist, feminist reformers to run for public office and to win. And since our creation, we have trained over 35,000 women to run. We are the largest and the most diverse campaign and leadership program in the country. Um, today, you are joining us for a season two premiere of our Your Kitchen Cabinet series. We are calling this um, season two, uh, the radical leaders uncovering the past to build a democracy we all deserve. And in this season, we will examine the origins and ideas that birth democracy in this country and how those ideals still um, reverberate today. We know that um, many of you are currently running for public office or are working on a campaign. And as you seek to transform our democracy during this time of COVID-19 and the uprising, we believe at Vote Run Lead that it's important to understand how our democracy really came to be to illuminate where we are going, and most importantly, to reveal what type of democracy we all deserve. So for each week, for the next six weeks, we will bring together leading experts and activists and trainers to help us shed light on those questions. But I also want to acknowledge that in this historical moment, we might not have all the right answers. Um, you know, we might not even be moving forward um, in the same way or um, agree on the final destination. At Vote Run Lead, we have been calling this a season of inquiry to describe the journey that we are on and the grace that we're giving ourselves and our peers as we seek to learn and to listen to really understand. Because we really do believe that when you know better, you do better. And so I hope you will join us in this season of inquiry and continue to tune in to these Zoom calls for the next um, six weeks. So what is the goal of today's call? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch now to the share the screen. And I'm going to share with you all. I hope I can do that. Oh, sorry. Can you all see that? Okay. So um, what I want to do now is I wanted to talk a little bit about what the purpose of this call is. Um, so for today, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to explore the United States origins, our origin story. Where did we really come from? And the many ideals and um, governance structures that have been touted by the founding fathers and the founding mothers as uniquely Americans were actually ideas and laws and values that came from an alliance of, of multiple indigenous nations called the Hadono Shawnee Confederacy. And so in today's episode, we're going to examine and uh, learn more about this coalition. Um, they were called the Iroquois Confederacy by the French and the League of Five Nations by the English. But the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is often described as the oldest participatory, participatory democracy on earth and its constituents um, and its constitutions believed to be the model from which the American Constitution is based on. So we will have two speakers, Prairie Rose. Really quick. Oh, sure. You're not on the slides. Oh, can you guys see that? Can you guys not see it? We see the um, case study. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay. 
Let me see here. So let me stop the sharing and let me try it again. Sorry about that, you guys. No problem. Can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, hearing from two speakers, Prairie Rose and Sally Wagner, who will speak about our origin story or the real story. And then ironically, while the ideas and laws and values of the um, Haudenosaunee Confederacy were integral to the writing of the constitution, Native American culture and religion was actually outlawed until 1978 with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Um, how people gather, express their cultural identities and their religious practices continue to be an issue of contention in modern America. And most recently, the restrictions placed on building mosques in certain neighborhoods or the uncovering of women's um, hijab for government IDs or even the travel ban, the Muslim travel ban. Those are all examples of how issues of religious and cultural freedom is being contested nowadays. And so our third speaker will be speaking to this issue of building mosques in, uh, in the South and how that has manifested. Um, after we have these three speakers speak to us, then we'll actually um, be broken up into small breakout rooms and we'll have trainers actually walk through a series of reflective questions for us to try to make sense of what we just heard. And so we'll have trainers, including myself and my colleague, Amanda O'Donnell and Star Haas and Aaron Velarde, along with Elena Reeves and Juanita Lewis and the Native Man, um, Prairie Rose will be a trainer again, as well as Faith Winter. And they will lead us through these questions after which we'll come back, reconvene and Aaron will make some announcements. So that is the agenda in front of us. And before we do that, I just want to say one final thing. And that is because this is a season of inquiry, I wanted to um, just make, make true this idea that um, we're walking this path together and we're not always going to have everything right. I know for myself in this season of the uprising, um, there are certain words that I've been learning and trying to um, incorporate into my own vocabulary. And so at Vote Run Lead, we have created these two documents. One is around vocabulary to use right now and one is on additional resources. And these are um, documents that we've created, but that's not the end of it. We want to invite you to share your learning um, with us in these documents and also to go into these documents and do some of your own learning so that we all really can um, can walk the season of inquiry together. And then last but not least, you know, we are really trying to create a culture where we are inclusive and we are asking good questions, sometimes hard questions. And so in order to do that, we do ask that you all respect each other and um, we want to be respectful of the time. Um, we want you to, if, if, if you're okay with it, to stay muted so that we can hear what you other are saying. Um, if you have questions or comments, feel free to put them into the chat box so we can be active in our conversation. And later on, we have opportunities to ask questions feel free to raise your hand and um, Mark or Maria Elena, who are the moderators for this, they will call on you and uh, you can ask your question. And last but not least, we are asking that people be respectful. And um, even if other folks' comments really irritate you, um, if you could just be respectful and don't yuck anyone else's yum. <laughs> that being said, um, I want to introduce our first speaker, Prairie Rose Seminole. Let me tell you a little bit about Prairie. Prairie is a citizen of the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota, descendants of the Ashnish uh, Arikara, the Northern Cheyenne, and the Lakota nations. Prairie has also worked on various campaigns to elect candidates and organize and train on issues from healthcare, gender justice, and marriage equality since she was in high school. She's been involved with North Dakota state politics since 2006 and has led North Dakota native votes since 2012. Prairie is actually younger than me, but she's someone that I've always looked up to for her wisdom and um, just her understanding. So I wanna um, open up the forum now for Prairie to, to present to us. Thank you, Paku. Nawa, Zutina Dagan. Hello, everybody in my uh, Rikara language. I'm going to attempt to share screen as well so I can paste through my slides with you. Um, let's see here. Oh, I need the host to give me access, please. 
All right, here we go. Can folks see my slides? We can, Prairie, thank you. Perfect. Let me move our chat box here so I can. All right, so where did we come from? How did the First Nations help shape the US government? Thank you, Paco, for the introduction. I've been uh, involved with politics for a very long time because I, I have this hopeful reformer hat that I typically wear that says, if we can get enough people in the system, we can change it. So the Haudenosaunee uh, are incredibly influential in how our governance structure has been shaping over the last uh, 500 years in this land, uh, well long before the US government was a government. And it's, uh, it means the people of the Longhouse. So who are they? The Haudenosaunee, and sometimes known as the Iroquois Confederacy, they're not a tribe or nation. It's a political and cultural union of several different nations and tribes. And this group is, is older than America. This group started when the, the, the explorers, the Vikings, and others were coming into the new land, and the nations decided, hey, we better be better prepared because there's probably no stop in the near future of people coming into our lands now that they know about us, right? So they're also known as a civil, one, one group in particular of the civilized tribes. There were several civilized tribes, but the Confederacy is made up of the Mohawk, the Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca people. And they're now in the area of Ontario and Quebec in Canada, as well as the state of New York. I'm gonna go by pretty quickly with some of these other pieces. So one of the pieces that you really should know about the Haudenosaunee, as well as many other tribal nations, my own tribal nation, the Arikara people, the Sanish people, were matriarchal. And so that means that, it doesn't mean that the women have necessarily more power than the men, but we all have roles to play. And that means we all have uh, this lens in which we view not just governance, but community and family. Um, there is no individualism, right? Our life and our existence affect those around us. Our decisions affect those lives around us. And so you need to know that a matriarchal society um, is one that takes care of each other, right? When we think of the healthcare and the wellness and all the social factors that, that contribute to positive well being in community and family and, and your own home, um, that's what it means, a matriarchal society. It's not necessarily women have more power. I mean, we do, but we don't tell the men that sometimes. All right, so the gender division of labor. Men are the protectors because they don't give life, they have to protect it, right? So, and these are just real basic pieces. This, don't take this as like, ah, the men just have one role. No, it's, it's more than that. But just to give you an idea of specific um, lineage in which they follow, there's, there's so much uh, in regards to non-linear ways of thinking in a matriarchal society, but the, the identified genders um, that we see today in our binary world men, women, male, female, they didn't necessarily exist uh, in the same way that they do now then. So, and women, uh, we also own everything. Women own the home, they own the, uh, the, the belongings. In my culture for the Eureka, just so you know, it's really easy to divorce your man if you're married to a, a man. You just take his favorite stuff and you just put it outside the door and you're done. Say goodbye, man, um, or your partner. So it's that easy. Uh, matriarchal society as well with the Haudenosaunee, the clan mothers name the children. That's not true in all tribes, but that means there's a specific lineage that comes down from your mother and that is passed down. So, and nicknames. Uh, most, most of us have nicknames that are not necessarily our ceremonial names. And uh, we had to adopt European names once they came in and started doing census with us. So um, that's another story though. Uh, two of the, the main players in the Confederacy are Deganawada and Hiawatha. And the primary reasons for the Confederacy, again, it's to eliminate incessant and tribal warfare, but largely because newcomers were coming in. It wasn't so much tribal warfare between the tribes, but there was some of that. Um, to create peace and give united strength, because we're better together than we are apart and alone, to create a powerful force of tribes, to safeguard existing Haudenosaunee territory and defense, defenses, 
to expand the territories as a collective and to establish the democratic government with representation. And we have a model of that. The Haudenosaunee political and diplomatic decisions are always made at that local level and they involve every community based on the idea of consensus. Um, the important thing to walk away with is that no action took place without the, the majority of the mothers. Um, and, and the idea of mother too isn't the same way that you biologically had a child. It was the women in the community. If you identified as a woman, you were a part of that matriarchal leadership council. And so me as not having a child biologically, I'm still an aunt, I'm still a clan mother within my own clan kinship system. And I could then be a part of this leadership decision making model. If, if somebody was biologically born male, but identified as a woman, then they could be represented and reflected on this as a mother. Um, so for example, you know, there, there's a judgment given by the Onondaga, the Seneca and Mohawk people are communicated with, the Cayuga and Oneida people are communicated with, and then there's, there's movement until consensus is built. And sometimes this movement happens very fast or like every other Congress, it could be two to four to six to 20 years, right? So we're, we see movement based on action and community need. Um, and the process just starts over until there's consensus and making a case. And tribes had organizers, right? I mean, we do this naturally. If there's a funeral, if there's a meal, if there's a celebration, if there's something to look at, we already have in place people who organize. So if there's a need like warfare or healthcare or whatever, um, there's organizers in the community already set up to do that. It's just, it's natural, you know? If you ever talk to a native person, we're already asking who your family is and finding out if we're related within the next two minutes. So the impact on the US government structure, both groups have ingrained checks and balances, both stress prosperity and liberty as goals for their people, both had a federation style government with a focus on local rather than centralized power. It was shared, right? It wasn't just one person could make or break the, the, the being of the community. But I wanna point out the two difference or the one main difference between the different chambers. So the Haudenosaunee had three chambers, the Grand Council with the elder brothers, the younger brothers and the Onondaga. Now, why is there a younger brother council, right? Why would there be a younger brother council? Because this is about citizenship. This is about identity. This is about engagement. This is about rearing up young people so they know their systems of governance and how the systems um, decisions are made, how organizing works. And these brothers, regardless of which chamber you're in, are chosen by the women. So you do not have the authority to sit at those tables unless the women agree. Now I'm going to go very quickly through some of this piece. So within just a few hundred years, you see that this is the indigenous population, uh, the land base and how it changes, right? Because of settler colonialism. So at the same time that our founding fathers are being inspired by the governance structure of the indigenous people that are, their lives are changing because of the food that we've uh, given to the settlers in the area, changing their, their entire dietary palate as well as their medicines. Um, prior to coming to the new land, people still had dragon's blood listed in their medical book as something to cure things. Um, there's no dragon's blood here. But the impact and the decimation of indigenous people here, at the same time that our government is forming um, we had a completely different view of indigenous people. Prior to the 1880s, before law was um, actually embedded into this country, the policy was genocide. Kill or be killed was the perception, right? Relationship building wasn't a, a good concept that met the needs of this settler colonial government coming into this new world. We had to have that idea of American exceptionalism uh, founding somewhere and this is where it started you know we had to have an enemy in that and so throughout the last couple hundred years uh, 
we, we had to fight for our own existence. The American Indian Alaska Native people were known as that because American Indians have tribes. There's over 340 tribes in the United States that haven't been completely ratified or implemented. And then another hundred more with Alaska Natives because they didn't become a state until um, the 1950s. So we have a very different relationship with the US government than any other citizen in this country. And the assimilation taxes of this government was to take our children away. It was to kill the elders and remove the children from the home. Um, and I won't get into this. There's plenty of resources that you can find online to deepen your understanding of how essential it is to remove a child from their home to strip away their identity. And so within just a couple hundred years, over 150 years of removing our children, um, we were getting tired of it. And so the American Indian Movement started. This was inspired by the Black Panthers. There was organizing happening with the Civil Rights Movement and prisoners within Minnesota were saying, our people are being killed. We might not have a lot of Black people here, but Native men are being killed. Even to this day in North Dakota, where I come from and, and live, you know, there's not a lot of Black, um, on, on Black violence, right? But there's anti-Indian violence and our native men are being killed, our, our women are being um, taken and, and we have a missing and murdered indigenous women pandemic happening in our own lands. So happening in Minneapolis at this time was organizing. And it was the elder women, to be honest, who not only said, hey, we're gonna use the name American Indian because that's what they use to put their foot on us. That's what we're gonna use to break, our, break out and use, use it to get our freedom. So Minneapolis has been the, the birthplace of many movements in the tragedy of our people, not just indigenous people, but black lives as well. And so there has to be the solidarity within the movements. And there was, um, we had great partnership with the Black Panther movement and the civil rights movement, but we had to make things happen. And so years of organizing went into place, partnerships that were developed um, that led to meaningful healthcare, or excuse me, meaningful legislation for American Indian populations, like the Voting Rights Act. You know, we became citizens in 1924, whether we wanted to or not, um, that wasn't a decision based on it for indigenous people, but we ne didn't necessarily have the right to vote. Um, this is true for other communities, you know, where states had the right to implement voting laws. Uh, and so they would put up literacy tests or they'd put up different measures in place that, that acted as barriers for us to vote. So it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act that indigenous people could actually vote um, across the country. And I'm almost done here. Uh, the, the two pieces I wanna look at just, so this Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act, this was really important. I told you 150 years of removing our children and putting them in boarding school. This act actually ended that. And so no longer could the federal government take our children away. That was in the 70s. I mean, it was before my, my birth in the world, but I had to understand the impact because my grand, my, not just my grandpa, but my dad was taken away and put into boarding schools, you know? So this really affects our generation. My dad was somebody who was never able to say, I love you and different things that showed affection because it was removed from him. You know, what happens to a child when they're removed from their family and community. And the other piece is the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. This actually happened during, I mean, the Nixon administration and the Carter administration, um, two fairly conservative administrations for Indian, indigenous people, but organizing happened among faith, faith communities, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Unitarians, the United Church of Christ, the Methodists, and the um, others all had a hand in organizing saying, hey, if we're founded on religious freedom, the natives should be able to practice religious freedom as well. And so it had to happen with partners and allies. And finally, I just want to show you this picture. This is a picture of one of the Indian agents in South Dakota whose name escapes me at the moment, and Chief Red Cloud. And I want you to see that they both are acting appropriately based on our cultural practices. Red Cloud is showing the Indian agent respect by being seated and not looking him in the eye. That's one way that we show respect to you because that, that is an action that's reserved for intimacy. So you would look your loved ones in the eye, you would share and grow um, with your in intimacy uh, relationship with your partner. Um, this wasn't something that you just did, right? And the Indian agent, he's looking him directly in the eye and he's shaking his hand firmly and he's showing authority by standing. But both are acting appropriately in their relationship um, to their culture and their upbringing. 
Now, how well do you think the negotiations happened <laughs> at those tables when you have a very different world lens in, in which you view actions for yourself and for your community? So as you walk away in this season of inquiry, uh, your story, your narrative uh, may not be the only one out there, right? There's different ways of being and knowing in our histories. So with that, I think I went a little over time, I apologize. Um, but uh, I'll be here for a little bit for questions, but I have a, a, a meeting after this. So I will end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prairie. You know, um, as you were talking, it, it made me think about how I think oftentimes we are taught in history class or in our social studies class, right, that um, our system of governance came from the Greeks and the Romans, and we have this very Western, you know, um, legacy or origin story. But the truth is, it was Benjamin Franklin and folks were going in and having conversations with the chiefs um, in the um, in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and learning about the Federation, learning about different uh, checks and balances or different chambers. And that became the architect for our constitution and our governance. And we're never taught that. And, and what we are taught, or what does happen, is that the very things that make um, made, made what America is America, those things were denigrated, as you talked about. So I want to thank you so much for sharing um, that story. And if anybody has any questions for Prairie, please feel free to type them in the, in the chat box. And after our next speaker, there will be some time for us to um, ask Prairie some questions. So thank you, Prairie. And now I want to introduce you to our second speaker. Um, her name is Sally Wagner. Sally is going to talk to us about how um, the women's suffrage movement in the US was also influenced by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, Sally is the executive director for the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Center for Social Justice Dialogue in New York. She's one of the first doctorate that was awarded in the country in women's studies, and she's the founder of one of the first college level studies, women's studies program in the United States. Uh, Sally has also taught women's studies for over 50 years, and she is an author of a book called Sisters in Spirit. Um, how, Haudenosaunee um, influence as early American feminists. So without further ado, Sally, thank you. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, Prairie Rose, that was an extraordinary education in a very short period of time. Thank you for that, um, that very important experience. Um, I am on Onondaga territory. I in the um, the original homelands of the Onondaga. I am non-native. I am a settler colonialist uh, tradition uh, who came into this knowledge uh, sort of kicking and screaming as a white scholar. I just had no idea. But I want to share with you my journey. The most extraordinary thing to me is that women have had political voice on this land for at least a thousand years. The most recent dating of the Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of Six Nations, is a thousand years ago. And for that long period of time, clan mothers have been nominating, holding in position, and removing, if necessary, the chiefs that represent them in the Grand Council that Prairie Rose was talking about. Uh, the clan mothers have, have said that there are three sort of basic rules that they must follow. One is that the man cannot have committed a theft. He cannot have committed a murder. If he's a warrior, he must step down because it is a confederacy based on peace. And third, he cannot have abused a woman or a child. Um, that looks awfully good to those of us who come from the settler tradition, I think. And it looked very good to the women who, in the United States, in the mid-19th century, had no right to their bodies. Husbands could rape their wives. That actually, those laws weren't changed until the second wave of feminism, starting in the 1960s and 70s. A uh, husband could beat his wife as long as he did not inflict permanent damage. A uh, husband had the right to the children that the woman bore. He could will away an unborn child on his deathbed, and that child would be taken from the mother and given to its rightful owner. 
the women had no right to divorce. They could not leave a, a loveless and dangerous marriage. Marriage was considered a covenant with God, which could not be broken. And the law, which was common law based on canon law, said that as the Bible instructs that a woman is to be under the authority of her husband all the way from the story of Eve through the New Testament and, uh, and uh, St. Peter, Paul, um, that a wife must be under the authority of her husband. Legally, what that meant was that she had no legal existence once she married. So of course she had no right to any of her belongings. Uh, so they knew Haudenosaunee women. The most progressive women in the women's rights movement were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Matilda Jocelyn Gage got ridden out of history as the movement became more conservative because she was far too radical for them to remember. But I ask you to look up the name of Matilda Jocelyn Gage because that is where you will really find the story of the Haudenosaunee influence. Gage was given an honorary adoption into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation and given a real name, uh, Hawana Haui, She Who Holds the Sky, in 1893. That same year, she was arrested for voting in her own nation. She writes to her daughter and says, my, my clan sisters are considering me for a voice in the Council of Matrons, which would have given her a political voice in her honorarily adopted nation when she was arrested for voting in her own in a school board election. Um, these women, Stanton wrote about how divorce Indian style was that you put your belongings outside the longhouse when it was illegal for women in the white nation to be uh, to get a divorce. They wrote about the property. The International Council of Women in 1888, they're meeting for the first time internationally on United States soil. And Alice Fletcher, an early ethnographer, tells them the story of sitting with a group of Omaha women, Omaha Nation women. And one of the women gives away a horse. And Alice says, oh, hadn't you better talk with your husband? And the women just break out in laughter, these Native women. And she said, for a minute, I forgot that I was with Indian women. And she said, these women are saying to me, we are really, and the men even more, the Native men are saying to me, we fear for what's going to happen to us when we come under United States law, but we fear more what's going to happen to the women because they are going to lose their rights as, as Native people, but they're going to lose their rights as women and they'll be treated as badly as United States women. And that, of course, is the process that happened. While these women are gaining vision and, and the possibility of living in a balanced, equal world of cooperation, they see far beyond the vote. Gage and, and uh, Stanton said, the vote is simply a tool by which to lift the fourfold oppression of women at the hands of the church, the family, the capitalist, and the state. But at the same time that some of these settler women are being inspired by seeing women and knowing women, living among women who have rights that they can hardly dream of. It's not even rights, it's responsibilities within the sort of balance that Prairie Rose is talking about. That at the same time it's inspiring is being destroyed. As being destroyed, as she said, by the boarding school experience, we will Christianize and civilize these savages. And the, you know, there are people at the time, there are women, progressive women at the time who are saying, you tell me who's the savage. You know, white women, I'm a teacher, I can travel through Haudenosaunee territory anytime I want, I am absolutely safe. These men have no concept of doing violence against women. And at the same time, they're being trained into a disrespect for women through the boarding school experience. But the, the 
it, the vision that they gained, these more progressive women, it never was just about the vote, the women's movement. Before it becomes conservative, they are dealing with every issue that we're dealing with today. And the most progressive of them, and again, I call on Elizabeth Hedy Stanton and Matilda Jocelyn Gage, they begin to talk about a cooperative society, not a competitive society. They begin to question individualism. They begin to look at what does it look like when a minority voice is the most important voice? Because if you have a winner takes all, you have an unstable system. So, so making decisions through consensus is a much better process. So I'll just leave it there. I don't know if I've gone over. I have a, a broken screen, so I can't see what's going on. But uh, but I'll leave it there. And again, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And I honor all of you in your work to change the world, to make it a better place for all of us to live. Oh, thank you so much, Sally. I What you just said was so powerful. And I also love it how you told a, the story of um, the, the stories that you told it truly in the style of a storyteller. So thank you. Um, I was hoping that we could have some time so we could ask Sally and Prairie some questions, but we are running a little bit over time. And I know that Sally uh, um, is going to be able to stay with us. Um, so if you have any questions, um, let's just take maybe one or two questions and we won't take the full time that we had originally allotted. But um, are there any questions for uh, Sally or Prairie? before we go on to our third speaker. Yes, I have a question. Go um, for it. Can she spell uh, Matilda's name, please? Yes, M-A-T-I-L-D-A-J-O-S-L-Y-N-G-A-G-E. And I also invite you to look online at her major work, Woman, Church and State, Woman Singular. It's online searchable. And in it, she says, never was justice more perfect. Never was civilization higher. She is talking about the matrilineal, matrifocal, matriarchal societies that Prairie Rose described. Mark, do we have um, one more question? I have just a question for Sally and for Prairie Rose, if you could talk just a little bit about the great law of peace um, that I think some of us have been reading about at VRL as we've been um, researching and just would love to hear a little more about that influence. Prairie Rose should answer that. There. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was trying to unmute here. There's uh, somebody's weeding over here with a weed whacker. I think the 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 Great Law of Peace. Um, it's it's a in in the oral tradition. A lot of our laws we didn't have writing in the same way that um, that other communities and 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 governance structures had. Other other civilizations had right, but the wampum belts and the stories that are kept within the wampum belts was just a way to record uh, what was happening amongst the Onondaga Nation um, and the, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And um, they were not transmitted in a written language other than the wampum sim symbols. And so the oral tradition, that's one way I learn as a person. I remember so much more what I hear than what I see or uh, uh, read sometimes. Um, if you tell me something, I'm gonna remember that fact. And so this was kind of a way of rearing people up and, and having these conversations and meaningful pieces. But the, um, the great law of peace, I think is um, one part of history as a practice that isn't taught in the same way schools are teaching law and governments here. Like this is a practice, this is a culture, this is a way of being um, and, and a show of respect um, that, that we don't see in American schools and, and children. So I, don't, I just wanted to add that like brief note about what 
I take away from that. You want to add to that, Sally? Uh, that that background is so critical to it. Um, you know, when I speak, I'm speaking as an outsider. So I, I think you've really explained well, thank you, from the inside. So thank you so much, Prairie and Sally both. And um, if you have any additional questions, uh, like I said before, Prairie unfortunately has to run to a meeting, but Sally will um, be with us after um, the Zoom call to answer any additional questions. So um, as Sally and Prairie were talking, and as we are inquiring into our origin story for this country, it seems very far in the past. Right, but some of the issues like what Sally and um, Prey both were saying, these contest states, these issues and these ideas that were being contested, they are um, happening still nowadays. And so what I wanted to do is invite our third speaker, um, Sabina, to come and talk to us about some of the modern manifestations of the challenges of, of people trying to express their religious or their um, cultural practices. Um, Sabina, Ahoy Din, who I know I'm, I apologize and I'm betraying your last name. Sabrina is a Bangladeshi American Muslim born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and she graduated from Vanderbilt University in 1993 with a degree in mechanical engineering. In 2010, Sabrina helped launch the Sons and Daughters of Abraham Project, which brings Muslims, Christians, and Jewish Jews across Middle Tennessee together through interfaith dialogue and outreach program. Sabina is actually a founding board member and currently the executive director of the American Muslim Advisory Council, which empowers and um, empowers Muslim community in Tennessee through civic engagement, community building, and improved media relations. So welcome, Sabina. And can you share with us, you know, what are some of the modern manifestations of um, religious and cultural practices being contested? Thank you so much, Paku, for having me. And I, I love the presentation from Prairie and Sally. Learned so much. Um, you know, uh, the Muslim community today, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, we're late in the game in terms of we're always fighting for religious rights and um, just remembering that the indigenous people have been denied their rights for so many years. And it's just shocking to see the date, what, what was it, 1978, when, you know, they were guaranteed their rights and we, we know it's still um, uh, precarious. Uh, so um, I, I'll, I'll talk to you yesterday, I guess I'll share my screen now um, about, about the controversy over the mosques. So let's see, let me get this, fix that. So why is building a mosque so controversial? Um, if you live in Tennessee, uh, you, you would understand. So this is a tale of two mosques in Tennessee. So we have on the one hand, the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro. And then on the other hand, we have the Islamic Cent uh, Society of Greater Chattanooga. And uh, it's not a very good picture, but here's a picture of our state. And, you know, first, we, you have to understand the political landscape uh, in Tennessee. So Tennessee is in the middle of the Bible Belt. You know, oftentimes Nashville is called the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's a reliably red state. Um, the larger cities uh, are more progressive. So Nashville's a uh, net. Nashville and Memphis are about the same size. Those are the largest cities. And then, then it's Knoxville, and then fourth is Chattanooga. Um, and Murfreesboro is, is about, uh, you know, uh, 40 miles, 30 miles from um, Nashville. And it was created, it is more of a white flight suburb uh, of, of Nashville, and but it has grown and changed. It has the largest university, state university uh, in Tennessee there, Middle Tennessee State University. And, um, and to understand, like, Na Nashville, the demographics have changed considerably. So in the 1990s, you saw an influx of immigrants from the Kurdish community and from the Somali community and just immigrants from around the world, whether, you know, uh, Latino immigrants or just 
just, you know, it, a lot of uh, refugee resettlement programs um, were settling people in the middle Tennessee area. So that change in demographics uh, kind of explains the, the, the change in political ad landscape. So, in two, you know, the story of these two mosques both began in 2010, ironically. So in 2010, Chattanooga, um, you know, there, there, there was an established Muslim community, but they decided it was now time to expand. So in 2007, they started, um, you know, coming up with plans of a new mosque, um, and it would include a full-time uh, Islamic school with a gym. But what, what they did is once they had their plans ready and they had bought the piece of land where they were gonna build, they took those plans to neighboring churches and they showed it to them and said, look, we you know we're gonna build here, you know, we're, we're just a religious organization and um, we are concerned about our children, we want a school. And so they build those relationships with, um, area, um, with the area churches. And, and so that outreach for them paid off. And, and so they got approved to build their, their mosque without any, without any controversy. So, uh, and, and that was great. Um, but then we have the story of Murfreesboro. So this is like 180 degrees, like difference here. Um, it's like, even before Murfreesboro had their plan, took their plans before the, the planning commission in um, Rutherford County, uh, they had a sign uh, on their property said future site of the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro and it was vandalized. Uh, in May, um, their plans were approved in the county commission meeting and there was no opposition. They, they approved it, everything was great. And, and then, um, then in June, uh, the congressional candidate in the sixth district and that covered Rutherford County and, and Murfreesboro, Lou Ann Zelnick, speaks out against the mosque. She actually goes on Fox News and speaks out why are they, you know, why are the Muslims building mosque? What is it here for? Is it a training camp? And at the next county commission meeting in June, you have like 600. Uh, 600 opponents of the mosque come come out and one of their the um you know leading opponents be besides luan zelnick was the world outreach church which she was a member of so the pastor of the world outreach church really brought out uh, all their congregants and you know at that time um it's that's the time of the tea party right and you know there were a lot of tea party um uh, uh, forums where they were talking about healthcare, and they would have members go in and spew a lot of uh, just disinformation and, and a hatred, and and these were the same kind of people that were coming up and speaking at the county commission, saying all kind of nasty things about Muslims. So that summer was just a terrible summer for Murfreesboro for the Muslims there. There was you know all this opposition at the same time. There were a lot of churches and community groups who reached out to the Muslim community and say, hey, we're on your side. You should have the right to build a mosque. You know, you need our help. We're, we're, we're standing beside you. So then you saw protests and counter protests. And, and um, you know, in August, uh, construction equipment on, on the site was vandalized, it was set on fire. Um, the mayor uh, of Murfreesboro actually supported the um, construction of the mosque because they followed all the rules and they were approved. Um, but that, that led to a whole series of lawsuits. So, um, so it's, it's interesting because in, in cases around the country where, um, where community members have tried to prevent the building uh, of a mosque, it's usually they would go and say, well, we don't know about, um, you know, how much traffic will it bring, bring in? We need to have a traffic study. Um, so here, I, you know, the opponents of the mosque were upfront that they hated Muslims and they thought that this mosque would be a training ground. So you had uh, Lori Cardoza Moore, and she was a known kind of Islamophobe in the Middle Tennessee area. She had the 
uh, organization proclaiming justice to the nation. Um, she spearheaded a lawsuit against Rutherford County. And it's interesting because the lawsuits weren't against the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro or any Muslim individual is against the county for approving um, the, uh, their plans to build. Um, and so, so they were saying, well, you know, there was an adequate notice given for this public planning commission meeting where they where the uh, Islamic Center of Murfreesboro was approved. Um, and then, but also they were saying that uh, because this is a mosque, there'll be Muslims there, uh, that residents and the plaintiffs, they had three plaintiffs, were in danger of their life uh, because the mosque was being built. Um, so uh, the ruling on that, you know, said, you know, the judge said, you know, there's no danger to anyone's life, but he kind of left the door open um, for the next lawsuit in September 2011. Um, against the county uh, for not providing enough public notice for the meeting in which the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro's plans were approved. So it, it was saying they were violating open meeting laws. And uh, in May 2012, uh, the judge Corlew, he agreed uh, with the plaintiffs and ordered that the county commission meet again to reapprove the plans. And so, you know, the, at that time, the mosque was almost, almost built um, and, and it was ready for uh, an occupancy um, certificate. Uh, and so that's when the Justice Department stepped in and they filed a lawsuit in the middle district court. And then, um, and it was using, it's saying it was a violation of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. So saying you could not uh, discriminate the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro based, um, based on religion. And, and then Islamic Center of Murfreesboro also filed a lawsuit um, in, in connect, conjunction with the Beckett Fund. And, in, um, and 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 they won those lawsuits. The, the well, uh, they won the lawsuit, and they were able to open in 2012. But uh, still, uh, there was a, still another lawsuit in 2014 against uh, this building of the cemetery on that land. And so uh, the lawsuits were draining that community. They suffered. It was traumatic to go through that time because kids were being bullied at school, people were being discriminated at work, you're just going out to the grocery store, uh, and you just turn on the news and there's all this hatred being spewed. Um, so I think it's important to understand in this whole, whole scenario, the role of politicians. And, and why was, you know, Murf, uh, Chattanooga able to, um, to build their mosque without any controversy? And why was, uh, Murfreesboro um, so uh, so traumatically affected, you know. So you have to understand that in 2010 there were congressional elections, and um, in the Republican, it's a it's a Republican um, area, you know. And so it was a, a race between Diane Black, Black and Luann Zelnick. Um, uh, for for in the primary race, so that summer, you know, that's how the politicians use these issues of uh, you know attacking the Muslim community, bringing fear mongering uh, to get more uh, get more points and and get more supporters. Um, and then in the state senate and state representatives, so the state uh, representative. Judd Matheny, he's, he was in rural Tennessee, and the Saint Senator, Bill Ketron, uh, he was actually um, the state senator from the Murfreesboro area. He's currently the Rutherford County Mayor. They introduced an anti-Sharia bill uh, in, in, con uh, in, um, in the Tennessee State Legislature. And so that, that's the thing. The candidates, the politicians were using these fear-mongering tactics to get vote, bringing up uh, concerns of security, terrorism, hate. And then we know that because of their tactics, hate crimes increase during an election year season against Muslim, the Muslim community. And um, also they use this idea of creeping Sharia. And so that's why in 2011, in the middle of all the contro controversy of the um, Murfreesboro Mosque, uh, 
Bill Catron and Jen Matheny introduced a bill um, uh, making Sharia illegal. So, you know, that's kind of a, the idea of Sharia law, uh, curtailing Muslim rights to practice freely, but it was really kind of a backdoor way of trying to stop the Murfreesboro Mosque from being built. And uh, what they did not expect is, you know, across the state, you know, at that time, we probably had about 60,000 Muslims, uh, majority in the Middle Tennessee area, but we organized and we, we brought Muslims to the Capitol and that's the picture there. We literally had hundreds of Muslims in the Capitol while we had the committee hearings speaking out against the bill. And so we were able to bring a lot of, um, uh, a lot of our supporters and allies on board to fight against that bill. And it was after the anti-Sharia bill that the American Muslim Advisory Council was created to fight Islamophobia full time. But also you have to understand, so there's, the politicians have a role uh, in, 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 uh, in how, how this, you know, all this controversy uh, with the building of the mosque in Murfreesboro uh, happened, but the role of Islamophobes. And so that, that's another difference between um, Chattanooga and Nashville. Nashville has al was already the home of some local well-known Islamophobes. But just that summer of 2010, that is when the whole controversy over this quote unquote ground zero mosque in uh, New York was happening. And in, in that time, that's when, you know, all the protests in Murfreesboro started happening on the uh, mosque there. Um, so Pamela Geller, he, she, she's the one who led all that in New York. Uh, but Nashville has the largest chapter of Act for America, which is a hate group against Muslims. It's, it's just a hate group for Muslims. And, but it has the largest chapter in Nashville. Um, Lou Ann Zelnick, who was running for the 6th District, um, she founded the Tennessee Freedom Coalition. And their whole purpose was to fight against Muslim and attack Muslims. Local Islamophobes, you know, Julie Cor Cord Cardoza Moore, of course, she's the one who's filed the first lawsuit um, against the, the, the county. Um, Bill Warner talks about political Islam, Kathy Hinner's daily roll call. Um, uh, so these are local Islamophobes that literally go to to churches and and communities across Tennessee, especially in rural Tennessee, and you know, spew this hatred against Muslims because people, you know, there aren't that many Muslims. People don't know any Muslims, and so they're kind of feeling that knowledge gap with their hatred. Um, and then we have Frank Gaffney, um, and he's the head of Center for Security Policy, and he talks about creepy creeping. Creeping uh, Sharia. So, so this is one of the questions during the lawsuit, during the first lawsuit. Is Islam a religion? So does it get the protections that churches and synagogues get for land use? So if you can prove Islam is not a religion, then you don't get those protections. And so in the first trial, he actually came in and says, no, Islam is not a religion. It's a political ideology. And this is one of the tactics of the Islamophobes to uh, take away our rights, to take away our First Amendment rights. So uh, literally, the US Attorney's Office had to file an amicus brief stating the US has always recognize Islam as a religion. So, you know, that was, is one tactic has been used, being used to, you know, take away the rights of Muslims. Um, so, you know, these different tactics that, that were being used, you know, first, you know, stereotyping Muslims using that whole security threat, you know, people were saying, the Islamic Center Murfreesboro was a terrorist breeding ground. It was going to be a training center. Um, and then the idea of creeping Sharia over time, all, all Americans will have to live under Sharia law. And of course, you know, all their stereotypes of what um, and misinformation of what Sharia even means, because most people have no clue what it means. Um, and then, you know, so those kind of outright racist, uh, big, bigoted remarks against Muslims were being used to stop the uh, building of mosques. 
but also uh, this idea that Islam is not even a religion, it's a political idea. Um, and, then, and then in this, in the Murfreesboro case, case, the lawsuits were against the city again, because they were, uh, they were saying that weren't enough, there wasn't enough notice for the meeting. So it was against uh, open meeting laws saying, you know, because this was a mosque, uh, the normal ways of making, giving public notice for the meeting, like putting it in a newspaper, was not enough because it was a mosque. There needed to be extra publication because this, this, you know, this concerned the safety of the community. Um, the graveyard opposition, which I told you just in 2014, they, they won against that, but that was because Muslim graveyards are a little different. And, and so they were challenging that, but they lost. Um, but we've heard those kind of oppositions across the country and of course traffic concerns. That's probably the number one easy way of kind of getting at Muslim uh, uh, places of worship. Oh, if you know you build in this residential place, traffic will uh, increase, we need a traffic study and it'll cost more money and the community, Muslim communities usually don't have that much money um, to spend uh, on building and doing a traffic uh, study um, before they build a mosque. So mm -hmm. those were tactics at 2012. The both mosque is funny. They both started at the same time, 2010 and 2012, August 2012. They both opened in Chattanooga and Murfreesboro. And, and you know, they had large openings with the U.S. attorney, law enforcement, elected officials came up. Um, but, you know, Chattanooga's mosque opens without any controversy because, you know, they had done the work, but it was just a different political landscape. Right. It was just a different, you know, in terms of Islamophobia, it was different in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. um, and and Ch Murfreesboro still <laughs> has issues in terms, 2017, there was vandalism at their, um, at their mosque. But again, they do have a lot of support from the Murfreesburg uh, mm -hmm. community. And so they are always grateful that the laws eventually work they were able to open and and all the um all the connections and the allies and friends they made over the years thank you sabina right i mean i think that um this case study shows us the importance of political leadership and the importance of organizing right and stakeholders to um to really affect the outcome so i want to thank you so much sabina for your presentation um you know i'm always reminded i think about when i look at history and i say oh if i had been alive you know 100 years ago or whatever i would have done this and your case study is showing us that actually these issues these contentions of religious and cultural expression is still applicable nowadays so thank you so much all right welcome back thank you everyone for staying uh, about half of us stayed thank you so much um hopefully you can see me thank you Paku. thank you to prairie rose um to sabina um and to sally for joining us today so a couple of things one we most of us probably didn't get to do the breathing exercise at the end to sort of zen out and stay a little bit calm um because one of the things we don't you know want is for you to leave with this anger and without any sort of righteousness like activity right we want we want that energy and i know some of the words we said we felt a little overwhelmed we felt angry we felt sad we felt hopeful um we you know felt frustrated at the slow pace of change how there's so much work to do um but we want to just make sure that this also we're leaving you guys feeling very actionable right and and just having that one question to say this is as I go about the world in my own leadership, I'm going to continually ask myself this because now that I know better, how am I going to do better? And having that one question to say, you know, when I go into my city council meeting or when I'm talking to an elected official or when someone knocks on my door, I'm going to ask them that question, right? If they want my vote, if they want my donation. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the other thing I want you to do is uh, help us spread the word about these because we have five more. Um, we're going to adjust the timing to make sure that we keep it, you know, for those of you who stayed, thank you, but keeping it to the hour, or either scheduling the longer ones for a full 90 minutes. Um, Zaneda has a toolkit, a social media toolkit. If you put one post up, we would be very grateful and you will be a vote run lead ambassador. 
Tomorrow, we're gonna talk about the future. So on Wednesdays, we're doing a historical perspective, the past, we're having somebody really talk about the present. And then the following day on Thursdays, live on um, Instagram or Facebook and many of our social pages, we're gonna have somebody who really to talk about the future. And tomorrow we have um, Bushra Amiwala, who I'm so glad to call a friend, who is a part of a new movie called She Could Be Next around women of color's political power. Um, but she's also the youngest Muslim elected official in the country um, out of Illinois and has and is really the future, quite literally the future of um, our government, the future of our democracy. Um, and so she'll be joining us tomorrow to be on Instagram live. And if you don't have that, again, you'll get all the recordings in your email a couple of days later. Um, am I forgetting anything, Paku? I'm feeling rushed. No, this that's fantastic, Erin. And I just want to say um, we're committed to this for this Zoom call until uh, 1.30 my time, 2.30, I think, East Coast time. So a couple minutes. So Sally and Sabina will stay on if anybody has any additional questions for them. This is Victoria Reinhardt. I don't have a question, but in the chat room, uh, it, it ended before we could, before I could say something that I think is incredibly important. People were talking about wanting to run, but oh my gosh, it's so hard. And, and the, um, what's it like to go to a door and have somebody say something nasty to you? Well, I am in office and I've been in office and uh, for 24 years and I'm going for uh, one more term. Um, and I want to tell you, and I want women to really understand this. Um, when I go back to a high school class reunion, the things that I hear are this. How did that shy girl in high school turn out to be you? And if there had been a category for person least likely to run for public office, you would have won it. The fact of the matter is, if you have the fire in the belly and you really want to do something and make a difference in the world by running for office, you will get past that. I haven't changed my personality, but I care so much about what I do that people understand that this is, this is the way you can make a change. Doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt, but you know what? Even the most self-confident, outgoing extroverts in the world, um, when somebody says something bad, it makes you feel you are human and you're going to feel that. So it's not that it's easy, but if you really want to do it, don't worry about um, you know, being shy or, or, or being concerned about that because you will get through it. So I just, I felt like I needed to say that, but we ran out of time. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much, Victoria. And so I just want to open just up- Go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, I just want to open it up again. If anybody has any questions for Sally or Sabina, um, please feel free to ask. And how lucky are we? How lucky are we to be um, amidst each other in this learning? Um, this is Sally, and I have a question for Sabina. Go for Go ahead, it, Sally. So, uh, Sabina, uh -huh. um, I was wondering, between the two uh, mosques and the um, participants and members of those mosques, which one also merged with the community? at large better? The one that did the steps or the one that forgot to do the steps? Um, I mean, that's the thing. The Marcusburg community, I mean, they had uh, a mosque, a building that they had, they had bought um, in 1997. They had been around for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, they, you know, it wasn't, and you know, and, and if you read about Chattanooga community, they're like, well, you know, we were a part of the community. Of course, Murfreesboro, you're going to have, because MTSU is located there, you're going to have more newer populations coming in, students, and that growth was happening um, at, at a high rate where that growth wasn't happening at that rate in Chattanooga. So, so you, you probably had more influx of new people, but you know, it's, it's not so much they didn't you know, make those connections. Um, it, it is more that it was a, it was a, a, a university town. Sabina, and, and, can I, can and, I and, have a question on that? Uh-huh. 
in in the in the community where there was so much controversy do you think if one elected official if one leader had stood up and said this is islamophobic this is racist and we're not going to take it do you think that would have been enough or could that have changed the tide cuz it seemed like the environment was breeding mm -hmm. a part of that hostility right right um in Murfreesboro, would that have changed it? You know, I, and I, I said in the beginning, the Murfreesboro mayor that supported the decision by the county commission, he was actually a Republican, and but he de, he defended the decision. But did he defend it and go out enough? That that is the question, and I, I think and and I, I think enough was not done in terms of city officials. Um, mm -hmm. They were like, well, you know, they're a religious organization, technically we have to approve them. Not going out and saying, no, this is a good community, they deserve to have it, um, in, in that kind of robust kind of response. That mm -hmm. did not happen. Even to this day, the, the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro still has a hard time uh, getting the city leaders to actually come to the mosque and have discussions. You know, there's still that tension in that city, even though there are a lot of supporters, there's still some of that residual tension. And, and I said, Bill Ketron, who's, uh, who uh, introduced the anti-Sharia bill, um, he is now the, the mayor of Rutherford County, you know, which is Rutherford County. Like that kind of tells you how much has not changed Right? Yeah, how much has not changed there? Thank you, Sabina. Is there any question? I think Sally, are you still with us? Sally Wagner? Do we have, do we have a question for Sally? Aku, this is Lisa Sun. May I ask a follow-up to your question to Sabina? Sure. Sabina, I appreciate really the walkthrough. Um, I have a sort of an analog for you. Uh -huh. um, much of what we're reading today in America's mass media and social media troubles me a lot. And one of the reasons it troubles me is because we have a global pandemic in which much of the narrative seems to be really politicized for a very, I think, very destructive purpose. In, in, analog, in really creating the an, analog for your sort of experience with building the two mosques, may I ask how much of the mass media helped or not helped in shaping the collective viewpoint of whether this particular institution should exist in anywhere, particularly in neighborhoods where there are really large contingents of believers. And, and that goes back to whether um, the Muslim community story is being told, right? And so you have that image always going on. And of course, Islamophobia is tied to the war on ter terrorism, right? And that is what people are seeing. And then their, you know, you, terrorism acts are um, like 350 times, uh, they're, they're repeated on media 350 times more than uh, um, acts by so-called white lone wolf uh, shooters. And so, you know, and, and because 2012, again, the Ground Zero Mosque, media was already covering that, um, and so the coverage, a lot of it was not on saying, well, yeah, Muslims are a community, they, they too want a facility to go and take their families, a community center. That story wasn't being told. It was being told, oh, are they safe? Uh, or, you know, uh, can we trust them kind of way? And the Muslims had to respond, no, we're safe. You know, we're, we're okay. Don't, don't be scared of us. And so, you know, being able to tell our stories as human beings and being heard is so important and it affects how people see us and just taking us out of that um, narrative of just being security threats or apologizing for terrorist acts. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that, is, that is on the media um, because how, how many, you know, we're tired of having to say, no, we're not, violent or we're, we're safe or you can trust us you know we just want to live our lives Sabina I feel like that's the perfect ending right because we want to tell our own stories our voices matter our humanity matters mm -hmm. 
So listen, I want to thank everybody um, for staying with us until the very end um, of this Zoom call. Thank you all so much. I think our Zoom time has ended, so I think it's going to close us out in a bit. But um, please don't, um, don't hesitate to join us again, both tomorrow on Facebook when Erin is going to be interviewing. Uh, Instagram. Oh, Instagram, sorry, Instagram, when Aaron's going to be interviewing um, Bushra. And then next week, uh, also same time Wednesday at 1 p.m. East Coast time, where we'll be talking about um, slavery and the Revolutionary War. Thanks, everybody.